and I will talk today about our work on the observation of the phononic lamp shift. And before I start, there are two important things that I would like to state. First important thing is there are a lot of people involved, so I'm just like representing the team. And these are all the members who work with us on this. And given that we're so many people, this is also important for us. That's why they are down there. Okay. So now I'm an experimentalist. And as an experimentalist, typically we want to do our experiments to answer some kind of question. So I would like to start out this presentation with a question. And for me, the question was, what is a quantum bath? And the first naive way that I commonly do if I have a question is I will ask Google. Because Google knows most things, right? But clearly here, this was not the answer I was looking for, which is something very, very interesting for me as a researcher. Because either this is fake news and so on, or there's something new to learn. OK? Probably the more useful answer. So the first thing that we did, uh, that I did, is I told them something is wrong here. And then given that I'm fairly convinced that people didn't really have a very good answer on this, we are trying to figure out how to answer this answer experimentally. Not theory-wise, not arguing, but let's ask nature and experiment how to answer this. What is a quantum bat? So now I will try to convince you what would be a good probe to test do I have a quantum bath and how to test this. But first, I have to tell you what I think a quantum bath is. Okay? And so I, I really like the vision of these condensed matter systems where you have something like this silicon wave or very, very pure systems. And if you cool them down, you would say you have a perfect lattice and your ions would sit there. But this is not entirely true because they are confined and quantum mechanics tells us we have this zero mode vibration. And these vibrations are quantum fluctuations, which would definitely make a difference between empty space where you have nothing and the quantum vacuum where you have these quantum fluctuations. And this is exactly what we would like to see. But now the question is, I can tell you all kinds of stories. How do I observe it experimentally? And this is then the, the next step. So the approach that we would choose here is actually not directing the system, observing it directly. But we will do the following. We put in a little test particle. For such a system, it would be something like an electron. And then you look, how does the test particle behave in this modified environment? Okay? You put it in an environment into the quantum vacuum, and you know that this quantum vacuum <coughs> would change its properties in some way. So typically, in the condensed matter context, you would call this a polaron. And this polaron, this green region here, will have some modified properties. Now again, what are the properties and the modifications that we would like to observe? Well, there are, again, I think a very cute, simple picture here which can guide a bit the idea that we want to have. And it's this idea of a quasi-particle that we have. And typically, it comes back that you have something that is dressed. And this dressing changes two fundamental things. The first thing is typically your quasi-particle will get heavier. Okay? Here for the horse, it's not just the horse, but also the dust. And what I like about this picture, too, is that for most cases, this increase in the effective mass will be quite weak. Like the dust is really not, it's, it's a small correction, typically. The second thing that will happen is that the dust settles and it gets renewed and so on. So your quasi-horse or your quasi-particle typically has a uh, finite lifetime. So these are the two things that typically for a free particle will be signatures of I have a quantum vacuum in my system, OK? And it's present. So now, experimentally, we would like to test this. So what we would like to do is we immerse our particle into this. Um, I will tell you later how I want to do this vacuum or bath. But we would also like to know where it is. It's not supposed to roam around through space, but we really want to tight it, trap, um, trap it very tightly. So what we do then is we to, uh, take a harmonic oscillator and trap it so tightly that only the, the lowest two energy states are important for us. So now we know that these states in the quantum world have some energy spacing omega naught, which is the oscillator, uh, harmonic oscillator frequency. Okay. So now let's discuss how this is changed, this bare state, due to the existence of the quantum vacuum. Well, the first thing that I know is I will have a first excited state, which has some finite lifetime. 
And the second thing that I would naively expect is that I have an increased effective mass. As I have an increased effective mass, my uh, uh, oscillations should become slower. Okay, if I'm heavier, I'm oscillating slower. However, all this discussion, especially about the mass that I gave you, was derived for, is a concept that only works very well for free particles. Here we are tightly trapped. Okay? So unfortunately, like the simple ideas that I gave you previously, don't work that well in this case here. But you have to go through the full calculation of the self-energy if you want. That's what, what would describe you the energy levels and the structure of your, of your trapped particles. And then, basically, theory can tell you whatever, like, what will happen. And in a generic way, you will keep the finite lifetime of the first excited state. <coughs> but now, the energy spacing is not necessarily smaller than in the bare case, but it can become also bigger than in the bare case. And now for the terminology, it's the difference between what I would expect it without any quantum vac uh, without any vacuum, so just the harmonic oscillator, and what I observe. This is called the self-energy shift, or experimentally just the observable energy shift. And for historical reason, what you would have here expected from the um, effective mass picture, and what you actually observe experimentally. This difference is something that you would call the, the lamp shift more closely. It's one way of calling it. Okay? So while I'm doing this analogy, while well, it really comes back here to our system, we can call these effective two states like a, it's a bit of a Mickey Mouse picture of what a real atom is. Okay? And we can see that this real atom, there's some, some decoherence for the first, uh, some spontaneous emission. And these interactions with the phonons will shift our energy levels. That's what we would like to observe. And these things have actually been already observed in the hydrogen atom a long time ago. First excited state has some lifetime. And then Lamp also did his beautiful experiments where he saw that the energy levels were not what you would have expected without the presence of the quantum electrodynamical vacuum. So he did his measurement. He saw that there was a splitting that was non-expected. Beta did the calculation beautifully. And he saw that by doing the right calculation in quantum electrodynamics, actually, this is explaining things. So this was the first experimental proof of quantum electrodynamics, really, and the existence of it, these quantum fluctuations. So this sounds like a relatively sound experimental tool to test if you have some kind of quantum bath or vacuum in your system. So that's the goal, trying to observe this coherent energy shift of our systems. And we don't want to just engineer it, but also measure it. So now I gave all the introduction of what we want to do. Now I will try to tell you what we actually did in the experiment and how we do this. So for all the tiny clouds that we have, we typically in our experiments fill up a full room with um, all kind of electronics and laser systems and so on. Here you can actually see the most important people. These are the graduate students. Without them, the system wouldn't work, of course. And then as you zoom in quite tinily in the system, what you see here is uh, uh, ultra-cold um, gas. So it's sitting here in this, in this glass cell. And here you have a mod, which is at the temperature of millikelvins or, or less. And we can regularly produce them. It's a beautiful yellow um, um, color because it's sodium atoms. Yeah? And we use these sodium atoms at a later stage. We will cool them further down until they're in a Bose-Einstein condensate. And we will lose, use them as the quantum bath. Next step. So now we have the ingredient for the quantum bath. However, we would also like to have the particles which will act as atoms or impurities, I would call them sometimes also. So for that, we take lithium. Um, it's the same idea here. And for lithium, the, the thing that you can keep in mind is for lithium, you can just change the nucleus. We can have lithium-6 and lithium-7. So we can have fermionic and bosonic particles. I will come back to this later. So now we have cooled them down. And at this stage, they are cold enough to trap them optically with, uh, just with laser beams. So I will start out with the properties of the sodium cloud. 
We have plenty of sodium atoms, which are very cold, such that they are condensed into a Bose-Einstein condensate, where we have plenty of particles in the same quantum state. Yeah? And then the, this will act as our quantum vacuum of that. So we have something like 10 to the 6 particles in such a system. And we trap them by shining in two laser beams, which are farther tuned from the resonance of sodium. Um, so how this works is you have this light potential, which is proportional to the intensity of the light that I shine in, and the detuning from the resonance. So if the wavelength is much longer than my wavelength of the resonance, the atoms are attracted by the high intensity regions. If the wavelength is smaller, they are repelled by this. I'm going through this because this will be important at the later stage, again and again. So here, highest intensity is where we trap our atoms. Okay? So this is now our first ingredient for the quantum bath. Now we need the second uh, ingredient, which will be our atoms. So here, this is the, the lithium atoms. You see that we have much less, uh, less lithium atoms, so that it's really a, a small perturbation to the system, and it's really immersed in the system. And what we do is we now want to really trap them very tightly to have well-defined um, discrete levels. And the way we do this is we shine in two lasers which can interfere, and then this interference pattern will create an optical lattice. And the wavelength of this optical lattice is chosen such that it's relatively close to the uh, resonance wavelengths of lithium. What this means is that this delta is tiny for lithium and very big for sodium. And basically, this, this potential here is more or less transparent to the sodium atoms, and it's very deep to the lithium atoms. Okay? So we end up with these pancakes of lithium clouds, which we will then use for our system. And also, the distance between the pancakes is here relatively big, such that we can neglect tunneling. So a lot of experiments we do tunneling physics. We don't do this here. It's independent realizations. Is so, it important that the sodium is a BEC? Yes, because the BEC will tell you that the low-lying excitations are phononic excitations, that it's a linear excitation branch. Yes. How many functions? Uh, between 5 and 15. So it's like it's the right order of magnitude here. Um, so this is actually how it ends up looking, like uh, from, from a comic picture. You have these lithium atoms, which are in the ground state of these harmonic oscillators. Um, the spacing here is something like 30 kilohertz. And then they're immersed in this uh, large uh, Bose-Einstein condensate, which I already said is basically transparent, uh, uh, basically doesn't see the um, lattice, but it still gives a tiny modulation. We will come back to this also later. Now, to detect the lamp shift, we want to see how does the presence of the, of the vacuum actually modify this spacing here. And we expect it to be a tiny change, right? <coughs> so we have to do very precise spectroscopy on this uh, level spacing. And the most precise spectroscopy that we typically have is some kind of Ramsey spectroscopy. I will go through this at some state, but uh, what we need is typically we need to excite our atoms in the first step from the lowest state into the first excited state of the system. And the way we do it, we take our lattice and we just shake it. And by shaking it at the right resonance frequency, well, you can see that you put the atoms in the first excited state. How do you see this? Well, we can do this so-called band mapping by reducing the intensity of our lattice um, slowly enough to be, um, to be adiabatic, we fold the energy structure that we have here in this lattice onto the, uh, onto the free momentum states. And then you can see in time of flight pictures that if the atoms are in the ground state, they are here in the first Brion zone. And if they're in the excited state, they're in the second Brion zone. These time of flight images are just done. You release your, your atoms from the trap. And as they are faster, they fly away faster. So you just take a picture after a certain amount of time. Okay. So you can then do this. You, you modify the shaking time, and you look how many atoms are in the, in the second Brion zone or in the first Brion zone, and you can see that you can have these Rabi oscillations. And then for the Ramsey spectroscopy, you will typically stop yourself at the 50-50 superposition. What okay. do you do to shape? Hmm? How do you physically shape? Oh, you, you, modif you use uh, an EOM to modify the face of one of the lattice beams. <coughs> so. 
<coughs> but it's only a tiny phase shift that, that you, you don't need to disturb it a lot. You should not, actually. Okay? So this allows us to do the first step of the Ramsey sequence here. I will take the block picture as a nice picture. Um, you start out at the south pole, you shake it enough such that you have a 50-50 superposition for your, for your level schemes. And well, in the second step, the nice thing for the Ramsey spectroscopy is that you're just waiting as you're on the, on the equator. And then you start rotating on the equator with a velocity which is directly proportional to your energy spacing. And for us, we're typically waiting such that it's oscillating 500 times around the equator. And then we would like to read out how much did it uh, oscillate, how, that, how much did it um, oscillate there. And to read this out, we need a second pulse here um, because we uh, have to map this, this phase onto a, a number imbalance. And this allows us, as we change the time of this readout phase, to get these, uh, these fringes, these Ramsey fringes. Okay? And fitting the phase of the Ramsey fringes then directly tells us what's the energy spacing here. It's a very standard technique, but it's very precise. So now we have to take a reference first. We do our Ramsey sequence only with the lithium atoms present. It's a bit as if we switched off the, the, the vacuum. Okay? It's empty space. And this gives us the reference here that you can see. And then we repeat the same experiment with the sodium cloud present in the background. And the first very good news is already we see a shift. So this is exactly what we want. Like, it's good news um, having a result there. And the result is actually going in the direction that we have an increased phase here. Uh, so the phase goes here. And it looks like we are running faster. And the energy difference is bigger than the bare energy difference. So this sounds good. But now that we have these results, we would like to do some, some systematic measurements on do we really understand what's going on. And one thing that you might remember is I told you that this lattice is not perfectly transparent to the, lithium at, uh, to the sodium atoms. So you might wonder, does this do some problems to you? So here, here are the same data that I showed you before. Um, and, and what we did there is we took the laser beams such that it's actually um, attractive, that the optical lattice is attractive for the lithium atoms. And then we changed just the wavelengths from 617 nanometers to 670 nanometers. So it's a tiny change. The lattice still has the same depth. All that changed is that now the lithium atoms don't sit in the intensity maxima, but now in the intensity minima. And what you can say is that the change on our spectroscopy signal is really quite dramatic. Because now we don't have uh, a phase shift in this direction. It's exactly the opposite direction. So this sounds bad, because this doesn't sound at all like we wanted to observe. Having a, a different modulation is not at all the signature of the lamp shift. But maybe we can understand this, and if we understand it, we can cancel it. So the idea here is that really we have these interactions between the sodium and the lithium atoms, and we have this modulation of the sodium background. So uh, imagine this case here. In this region, the lithium atoms sit in the regions where we have a lot of sodium atoms. And here, the important thing is that the lithium atoms are attracted by the regions of high density for the sodium, too. So you have the, uh, the optical lattice. And the, the density modulation of your sodium actually adds another effective potential. So the two terms add up to an increased effective trapping potential, which is exactly what we observe in our experiment. In the other case, now what has changed is the lattice steps is the same for the sodium, so the sodium st still looks exactly the same. But now the lithium atoms don't sit anymore in the high intensity regions for the, for the sodium. But now the lithium atoms are sitting in the intensity minima, where we have few sodium atoms. So the, it's actually counteracting to what your optical lattice would do. And I mean, we have a reduced effective trapping potential. Okay? So we understand the system, uh, this effect. So what we can now try to do is eliminate it systematically in such a way that we repeat our experiments for different wavelengths, such that we're going closer and closer to the resonance of lithium, such that the modulation of the background is getting smaller and smaller. Okay? So we have here these points. 
and you can see that we can fit it with a straight line. And the most important thing that you can see here is that the straight line doesn't cross at zero, but there's a zero, uh, an offset. So you have a flat uh, background and still have this shift in the energy spectroscopy, which is exactly what we were looking for, okay? We add the, the vacuum or the, the quantum gas, and we see that the level shifts, are sh uh, the energies of our particle are shifted around. So now this sounds nice experimentally, but again, we want to verify if we understand it well by talking to our theory colleagues. And now we have to model the system. Here I will only sketch the model. Um, so what we have is the ingredient for the atom. So this is just the standard, um, yes, it's the atom here. This is just the standard way of, uh, you have an atom in the trap, you, you have the levels, you can have excitations. So this is very simple. Here on the other hand, you have the vacuum. Again, this is a well understood um, system. It's a BC, which is weakly interacting. The excitations are phononic for low, energy, uh, for low wave vectors, and then it's single particle excitations for high wave vectors. And then we have very weak interactions in our system. So we can actually understand that we could describe this interaction, this VQ here, is, is, uh, we can calculate it. And we can understand the interaction such that if a particle goes from the first excited state down here, it must create a phonon, okay? And then the lamp shift is actually just the idea of having a particle which is absorb, uh, emitting and reabsorbing directly a phonon, and you have these virtual ex excitations. And if you calculate how do these virtual excitations shift your energy, then that's the lamp shift excitation, okay? So that's what we wanted to compare to our experimental results. And this is this blue line here. Yeah. So it's really just a perturbation theory uh, calculation. And what you see is, well, it, it lies very close to, to what we have observed experimentally. The error bars on the theory are not coming from the, um, from the numerics or something like this. It comes from the unknown precision, uh, from the error bars in the experiment, okay? So you, you have to know exactly your density, distribution of your atoms, and all these kinds of things. So we, we give the theorist some kind of experimental numbers which have uncertainties. He plugs it into the theory, and you see that the theory has these error bars. So this sounds very interesting. Now you might say, okay, all you observed is an energy shift. Why do you talk about the lamp shift? Um, I, I wanted to um, uh, make this, this point again. What we have is if we would have an, only this effective mass effects in our systems, we would always have a reduced energy shift in our systems because an effective mass means we are oscillating faster. What we observe in our experiment is actually that we are oscillating faster than we would have expected. So we know that there's a substantial difference between the effective mass picture and what we observe experimentally. We don't have access in our experiment to the effective mass, but we have, we have this qualitative function. Okay. That's, that's a good point. That deserves some discussion. Yes. So as a lamb shifter, I would say, well, the lamb shift is just the principal part of a bigger vice cup <coughs> cake. Yes. And I guess that's going from your yes. upper level, which you call yes. omega, and what is omega one? That's the, the uh, frequency of the emitted photon. Yes, so, so if you go through the literature on the lamp shift, it actually has a long history and it has a diverse history. Um, so the, the original history is obviously the hydrogen atom, and there it's the splitting between uh, the S and the P level and the hydrogen atom, it's, it's very well defined. Then um, comes the quantum optics communities. Um, I don't know when this paper, like, when, uh, in the 90s, right? Yes, so, so in the 90s, there was the quantum optics community, which observed the lamp shift. Ferdinand was one of the co-authors. And so there, it was exactly the definition. Because you don't have the effect, so in the quantum optics communities, you have the James Cummings model. And the idea of an effective mass and so on doesn't make much sense for the James Cummings model. You only have the system without dressing and with dressing. And the difference has to be the lamp shift, okay, the quantum fluctuations. And then there's a third community which comes into all of this, and that's the condensed matter community, which discussed this lamp shift, this phononic lamp shift, and the Froelich polaron for a long time. 
And what they try to do is try to define it as properly as possible in analogy to the, um, to, to the original lamp shift. And actually what we are trying to do here is very closely related to all the discussions in the condensed matter community. So we choose to, to define it like as close as, as the literature on the photonic or phononic lamp shift goes. And that's also why I try to explain what we mean here, because different communities really have different ideas what they think about it. Maybe it's better to call it polaronic shift, then it's not ambiguous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, so, 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 yeah, yeah. So actually the phononic lamp shift doesn't exist before our paper, like uh, the phononic, it's, it's so, so we defined it kind of. Right yes. So, so. <laughs> we have the experimental result. In the um, so now you can actually say, okay, th this is interesting, maybe, but like what you had is the fermionic particles in the background. Can you do more than that? And I already told you that we can have lithium atoms, which can be bosonic or fermionic, which means that we can change the quantum statistics. So we wanted to play with this, and so we did this. And what we did uh, is we first observed basically nothing. So you take bosonic particles, which are hot enough that they don't condense. And you do your measurements, and you see that there's no observable um, shift on your results, which is perfectly understandable. Because the interaction strengths between your bosonic lithium atoms and your sodium atoms is three times smaller than between your fermionic lithium atoms and your bosons. The lamp shift is a second order um, perturbation effect. So the strength of this lamp shift has gone down by a factor of 10. Signal to noise before was already not enormous. Now it's, I mean, you don't see it anymore here. However, now you can do something and you can start condensing your bosons. You take them and condense it and take plenty of particles that you condense and boom, you have this enormous shift here in the energy levels. I mean, enormous, you know, we are measuring here in the 10 to the minus three, but you really have shifted it up such that there's absolutely no question whatsoever that you have this zero level crossing at very high levels. And quite interestingly, so the idea here is really that it goes linearly with atom numbers, and it's like if you go through the calculations, it's this enhancement due to Bose enhancement. So the, the lamp shift really goes linearly with the occupation number of your level. And for bosons, you can pl put plenty of them in there. Quite interestingly, it worked better than we would have expected from theory. <laughs> However, on the theory, so now we would like to understand this. This is a bit annoying, right? We would like to understand this. What you can see is that the error bars on the theory are enormous. This comes from the fact that the theory is actually extremely sensitive to the precise density distribution that you have in your system. As you change your temperature, the density distribution can change quite substantially. And experimentally, we didn't have access to it in situ. So we had to calculate it, and we have quite some uncertainties on them. So that's, that's the reason. Now we wanted to nail it down, well, what's going on, and we wanted to do some relative measurements where we can try to cancel out this uncertainty on the density distribution and understand it maybe a bit better. So what you can do now is the following. Remember we did this shaking, so you can stop the shaking first at a very early time. So you only put a few of these bosons into the first excited state. What you can also do is you can do your spectroscopy with plenty of these bosons in the first excited state and then repeat the experiment. What you did here is you only changed the occupation in these numbers, but not the density distribution, no nothing. It's, it's, it's really a very minimal change, so you can compare things uh, more, more easily and look for scalings here. And what you see then is, um, here we show the excited state fraction, how many atoms did I put here. So here I only have a tiny number of atoms. The level, the um, ground state, due to the high occupation of the ground state, it's shifted very heavily. The first excited state only a tiny bit, so we have a large signal for the lamp shift. Then you shake it more and more, and you see that at some point, the first state is um, shifted as much as the ground state, which means that we don't see any shift between the um, dress system and the undress system. And this happens here for something like 75, percent or something like this excited fraction. But this is a mean shift shift? Yeah. No. Uh, we can come back to this mean field shift discussion. No, it's not. Uh, so 
Can I? Uh, yes. No, maybe this is the. So, yes. No, it is not. No. <laughs> so, let me try to answer how I understand the lamp shift and then, then we, uh, uh, the, 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 the mean field shift. Typically, my first naive way of calculating this shift here would be to take the so called Gross Pitayevsky equation put in the density distribution of my uh, impurity, the density distribution of my gas, and look for the eigenenergy solution C. This does not agree with these results here at all. The second thing is you can do this, but if you talk, but, but this calculation actually is not a perturbative uh, calculation. So, so, so you, you don't know what's, to which order does this which order is actually doing a modification here. So if you try to do a perturbative approach to how does the background change your, uh, your lamp shift, then the mean field shift is zero to first and second order of perturbation. Like there's no classical shift in the energy scene. That, that's what I'm trying to say. Okay. Uh, so this is the, this is the answer. Um, you can have qualitatively similar behavior like energy shifts due to the background, but it just doesn't fit into this picture here. Yes. Um, so what is important here is this is the experimental error bar. Uh, so this is the experimental data here. What we can now try to, to do is fit this linear decrease of the energy shift I mean, the, uh, the number imbalance changes linearly, so it, it, it's quite natural. What is the slope here? Well, the order of magnitude is the right one, which we have from theory. However, the really interesting question for the theory is now, where is this cutoff here? Because this is an answer which is very insensitive, actually, to the precise details of a density distribution. You see how the error bars went down? It's a very restriction um, answer here. And there, quite nicely, now our experimental data have good agreement with the theory. The reason here, I think, is that we have some uncontrolled systematic errors in our system on the density distribution, which we have canceled out in these relative measurements, and that we would have to cancel out experimentally by, by changing uh, our imaging and, and understand it better. So I think we have a good clue of what's going on. It's not perfect, but we have a clue there. Okay? So to this part, we have observed the phononic lamp shift. We have good agreement between the data for the fermionic case. For the bosonic case, there are still some questions, but I think we have very good ideas uh, where, where the discrepancy might come from. And um, well, why did we do these experiments? They, they are a good indication that we have really some quantum bath effect in here. And I think it's, it was actually a, a very interesting observation that you have this Bose enhancement of this energy shift. Putting more particles in there shifts the energies stronger. Okay. So in the last step, I would like to, to talk about an interesting evolution of this topic, um, which started with Gershon visiting us in Heidelberg. And he was actually asking the question if we couldn't do some kind of heat engine problems uh, in our system. And uh, we started discussing. And by now, I think that we have a pretty good idea of what we might be able to do or not. Uh, no. No, it's just a matter of doing it. So, um, so we, I had a lot of very fruitful discussions with these three people. Um, here, Wolfgang Niedensu is the guy who really worked hard on, on getting a good understanding. So the idea would be in this system, we want to have bath. Like, can we do a quantum heat engine? And more specifically, we won't try to extract energy of it. What we will try to do is using it as a cooling technique uh, in our system. We want to cool one of the two baths and see how well we can do here. Okay. So what we have is one bath of sodium atoms here and another bath of sodium atoms. And the way we do this is um, we have a lattice for the sodium atoms. And here, this is a, a picture of our lab. So you can really distinguish them. There's, again, no hopping between them. And so on. Now you have to change the temperature with some kind of a piston. Naturally, for us, the piston will be the lithium atoms, which are tightly trapped. Okay. So here I have shown a configuration where the lithium atoms sit in the system and the temperature and the trapping frequency of the lithium atoms is such that we have a few atoms in the first excited state. 
And now the idea is, can we lose, uh, use these lithium atoms to take out energy and, and temperature out of this bath? So what we will do is we take these impurity atoms, or lithium atoms, move them over here and change the frequency. Um, so this would be like the, the, the adiabatic stroke typically. And then in the system, the atoms will relax due to the very high frequency that we put there. So basically what we can do in our system is we change the trapping frequency quite simply just by increasing the intensity, which is uh, one of the things that you want to do in an experiment because it's really straightforward. So what you can do then is the atoms thermalize in this bath, they relax down, and you have put your, your, your energy in this bath, and then you move it back, and you start the cycle again. Okay. So now uh, this is what it would look like for the, like if you compare it, this is the, the, the diagram that typically is shown for the, for the for the auto cycle, okay, so it's really a very similar implementation here. And then the question was, well, this sounds very nice, but can we do something useful, practical with it, and what would be the limits? So Wolfgang actually ran some simple uh, simulations on this, um, just assuming some relatively um, uh, like normal parameters, I would say, for, for Bose-Einstein condensate. So you have these two baths, which are both at a rather high temperature at the beginning, the, the main difference between the two of them is that in this hot bath, you have much more particles than in the other one, because this way it's a nice reservoir. And then you just look how, what happens as you cycle through the system, and you can see that you can really cool down your, your cold bath by a substantial amount. So substantial, I mean, so this is, I think, something like 70 nanokelvin, and this is 700 nanokelvin. So you can take almost an order of magnitude of temperature out of the system. Given that we don't change anything else in the system, this also means that we could take out an order of magnitude and entropy in the system. Which sounds very promising, I think. I mean, so I, I did my postdoc with, uh, with Bill Phillips, who is obsessed with, uh, with cooling down systems, and it left a trace. So, so I, I, I'm quite interested in trying to do yeah. these things. It's a good obsession. Yes, uh, it's worked out well for him. Um, so now, now at this stage, uh, let's try and test it. And, I hope to tell you more about it in the time. Oh, yes. So, so sorry. So this is a summary slide, actually. Yeah. So this is an important one. We have a lot of collaborations with experimental uh, theorists. <laughs> we are looking for experimentalists to do the experiments. You know, Having ideas is one thing. Doing it is another thing, which is, in my opinion, the most important one. So, yes. well, one of the things that I found interesting about the land shift recently is that a collective Many atom land shift Dickey yes. has no divergence. I don't yes. have to subtract off infinities. And you were telling me about something similar to that in your work. Can you uh, explain what you Yes, thought? yes, yes. So I'm now getting into to, to d dangerous waters because I'm an experimentalist. But so this, uh, I show you the, the Feynman diagram for, for what is going on here. And you could just say this is a second order perturbation theory, even I can do this and I try to do this, what you will see is that the energy contribution that you observe here is diverging. It's, it's, uh, it just doesn't work. What you have to do is actually um, subtract contributions of advanced and retarded Green's functions, or things like that. And then things, the diverging times nicely cancel out and things work out. Yes? Okay. Uh, you will get roughly all the shapes and so on. Good. So, and usually you have to go to very high order of perturbation theory before you see difference between commutator and Poisson bracket. So I would say usually actually quantum and classical are the same, except okay. that quantum mechanics, of course, this uh, occupation numbers are quantized, especially if it's zero, a vacuum. Yes. Uh, it makes it difficult. So it, it's kind of, I think green function language is really over complicated. It's much more complicated. Okay, I, I, I'm happy to learn the simple approach. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, I mean, yes, I, I would be happy to. Yes? Okay, so my question is, so what happens if you, if you have phonons, if you don't have only vacuum, but you have excited states, and your, your DC always has some temperature. Yes. Do you see, you see any temperature change in the, mm -hmm. the lamp shift? Yes. So there, there's a very important thing here. Um, so in the James, this was something that I was really worried about at the beginning. 
especially given the discussions of the, of the James Cummings paper and so on on the occupation numbers. There's a very fundamental difference between our system and the, the typical systems is that we have plenty of modes. And these plenty of modes, even for high energies, can all contribute even if they are empty to this lamp shift. Which means that the few low-lying energy modes which might have some occupation, if you look at the influence that they have, it's really negligible. It's like the large, large number of high-lying empty modes which really does the energy shift. So it's a, it's, we, we went through this number, uh, calculation, and the few modes, if they're thermally excited, it's not, uh, yes. And I think the difference is really the large number of modes that you have in the system. change the trap frequency omega to start with and, and make now lower and higher frequencies, then you should see, you should sample different sets of modes, so to say. Yes, yes. So the modes that we are sampling is typically the frequency um, is very high. It's 30 kilohertz. The phononic modes are up to 5 kilohertz. So typically we, we sample on the high-lying modes. For very low energies, the, the excite, the, like the the, the, Robbie is, the way we excite the grunts, uh, the first excited state doesn't work very well anymore, so we're kind of limited to this. So actually the way I've always been thinking how you could really prove that it's the quantum version of the lamp shift and so on is would to look uh, for squeezing due to the presence of the in, the, in the impurities or on the background due to the presence of the background. However, this is a very like quantum vacuum squeezing experiment. Right, we have our but next speaker getting set up while we continue the discussion. Yeah.